Welcome to this week's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, I sit down with a different industry thought leader, and we discuss the latest cybersecurity trends, how those trends are affecting the work of InfoSec professionals, while offering tips for those trying to break in or move up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. 2020, as you know, is right around the corner, and with it, there is another presidential election coming up with all its attendant security issues. For 2020, InfoSec is attempting to get ahead of these potential issues. Use our free election security training resources to educate poll workers and volunteers on the cybersecurity threats they face during the election season. For more information about how to download your training packet, go to infosecinstitute.com forward slash IQ forward slash election dash security dash training or visit the link in the description. Our guest today is Adam Dara, Director of Intelligence for Vigilante. He's a national security and threat intelligence expert who spent eight years working for the U.S. government coordinating across several federal agencies to fill critical knowledge gaps on national security policies. We're going to talk about the 2020 elections and specifically around the concept of election meddling and coordinated disinformation campaigns, as well as ways that smart voters can separate fact from fiction when new shocking news comes into their social media feed. Adam Dara is an experienced intelligence analyst skilled in putting international affairs into cultural and political contexts. Before joining Vigilante, Adam served as Director of Intelligence at InfoArmor. Previously, he spent eight years working for the U.S. government, coordinating across several federal agencies to fill critical knowledge gaps on national security priorities, which helped form his specialization in Central Eurasian political security and intelligence issues. Adam holds a bachelor's and master's degree in Russian from the University of Utah, and the University of Arizona, respectively. Adam, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. I I just realized I should have asked beforehand. Is it Dara or Dara? It's it's Dara like Sarah. It's Dara fine. like Sarah. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. We will we will course correct on the way up. <laughs> um, so in a previous episode in the podcast, we uh, discussed some of the security issues that came to pass with the 2016 election, uh, as well as concerns that were surrounding the then upcoming midterm elections in 2018. Uh, Based on the most available research, can you tell me what kind of security breaches, tamperings, or other issues actually happened in 2016 and 2018 versus the predictions? Yeah, absolutely. Let's get into this a little bit. And I just want to set the stage with a little bit of context. Mm -hmm. Uh, Election operations from an intelligence perspective are are consistent and they're ongoing. Uh, And so in the lead up to 2016, you have uh, U.S. adversarial governments uh, working around the clock in three primary areas. You have the ongoing human intelligence effort to infiltrate campaigns, get to know people, and get insider information. You have a signals intelligence campaign where you're trying to, where an adversarial government's trying to get on your electronic communications and eavesdrop, and again, so they have an advantage. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you have, you know, open source information. Uh, that can be defensive as well as offensive. And what we saw in 2016 is really the first time a, a, few, ha- a few foreign powers decided to be very aggressive uh, in their offensive operations and misinformation campaigns. The ongoing signals intelligence and human intelligence operations, that was nothing new to me. It wasn't shocking to me. Uh, but the, the overt nature of the brazenness <laughs> in yeah. their open source campaigns to oh, yeah. misinform voters was quite shocking in 2016 and in the lead up to 2016. Now, how about 2018? Did I didn't really hear that many stories about the midterms. Were there any uh, any noteworthy um, security issues at that in that election? You know, from from where I was sitting at the time, uh, that was not uh, that for whatever reason. Again, yeah. The, for whatever reason, we didn't see as many brazen attempts to misinform voters here in the United States. Uh, and as far as the ongoing human intelligence and the signals intelligence operations, those, you know, remained in effect. You know, that mm-hmm. mandate didn't go away just yeah. because they purpo- some would argue that they purposely got their hand caught in the cookie jar on purpose to send a message to us uh, okay. in 2016. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. Do you have any theories on why 2018 was so quiet by comparison? Yes, I do. I think they've moved on to the next thing. I think hmm. I think our ad- our adversaries they pivot uh, very quickly. They're highly sophisticated in their tradecraft, and I and my, it is my personal opinion that they've already pivoted to the next thing in order to you know sprinkle some discord uh, hmm. and some misinformation uh, or perhaps something else uh, for future campaigns in order to disrupt. 
a very stable and to destabilize a very stable and democratically, you know, elected government. So based on your initial research, how many of these points of attack have been rectified? Are, are, are there new attack vectors? Do you feel like the things that were a problem in 2016 are still a problem going into 2020? Yes. Uh, in short, yes. <laughs> version, <laughs> you know, very bad. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wish, I wish, you know, and again, I'm not, I'm not exactly a cynic. I, I believe in America. I believe mm-hmm. in our, in, in the rule of law. You know, what's great about our country is that we do, we do have a rule of law. We don't rule by law. We're not arbitrary. Uh, we haven't gone down the arbitrary enforcement of law here yet. And so, you know, other people, uh, other people that operate here in this country, they can operate without, you know, they, we're not a police state. And so they still have the freedom, if you will, the freedom of movement to operate on the internet on our streets, they can go to parties, they can still, you know, walk around, you know, that we're not, you know, so the, so the traditional avenues to, let's say, get an advantage over American policymakers is still in effect, that hasn't gone away. Mm-hmm. I think our federal law enforcement have, have done an excellent job in doing the best they can with the tools they have. But, you know, since we're not a police state, you know, we're not going to monitor every single little thing that happens here. Right. Moreover, on the electronic side, on, on the open source side, and the, let's call it the hacking side, you know, we still have voter lists being leaked in the deep and dark web. Mm-hmm. We still have a concerted effort by um, legal business entities to get, gather information about uh, citizens here. Hmm. Uh, so, I mean, th- those threats and the data security involved with protecting against those threats, you know, that's still either really good or really bad, depending on the company's security practices. So those, yeah. those threat vectors are still there. Okay. Um, so since one of your areas of expertise is central Eurasian political security and intelligence issues, uh, as well as how nation states conduct disinformation campaigns, I want to learn more about that from you. So let's start by talking about any recent or noteworthy examples in your global area of expertise, Eurasian, of, of vote tampering or disinformation campaigns. Are, these, are there things that we should be watching and things that we can learn from this part of the world that could apply to the 2020 election? Absolutely. And I think that's a very well thought out question. Uh, you know, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to quote unquote, pick on Russia as an example, because that <laughs> happens to be my primary, you know, area of expertise. Sure. Uh, and I have a lot of respect uh, for the, for the culture and everything, but my goodness, you know, when in the lead up to 2016, you know, I was noticing things and techniques being employed. Um, on our soil that they've employed for a very long time against their Mm -hmm. own people. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so what you see and what, what you see is, you know, they want to prepare, they want to prep the battlefield. So election day goes the way they want it to. And so what you do to prep the battlefield is you control the media messages, messages, you control the narrative. Uh, Then you arbitrarily enforce, you arbitrarily enforce law uh, to send a message saying, Hey guys, you know, uh, any opposition that we're not too keen on, chill out, please don't destabilize us on election day. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you also want to have a a friendly, friendly opposition as well, an approved friendly opposition. Approved, absolutely. uh, Approved, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And on on election day, if things pretty much go your way, you you relax, you just, you know, because again, these, these countries want to be perceived as, as, as like us. Right. right. They, 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 look, we're, we're, we're the same. Like we're, we're sophisticated. We're stable. We've got an, we've got a democratic process and yep. uh, we, we, we love the law here. And so what, what you see is that, okay, they decided, okay, America is always picking on us. Um, America is always calling us out for being so unruly and silly and we're right. turning on against ourselves. We're unsophisticated. Okay. Well, how about this? How about we run a similar campaign? Uh, again, they're not making up the trade craft. Uh, this is something they've perfected on their own soil, and sure. they just turn the laser beam on us. And it's been heartbreaking to watch how how it's worked. In yeah. other words, you know, we have turned on each other. We have become a little less stable, um, you know, in our at least in our media narratives, in in the way that we think about elections. I mean. We have an amazing process. We have an amazing country. And to see even really smart people start to call the basic and foundational document into question, I mean, this is what I would call regard as a very successful campaign on behalf of, that our adversaries have conducted against us. Hmm. So along with uh, sort of the physical hacking aspect of it, I want to hear more about your research into disinformation campaigns that could be launched. You know, it's one thing to tamper with a voting box, which can be traced or explained and is patently illegal. But 
you know, it's another thing to spend, spread wrong information, you know, by using social media to spread news about candidate X and how they're losing so that voters are discouraged and might not, you know, be coming in after work to even bother voting at all. Or as you said, to reduce confidence in the interest of the very idea of voting. You know, this speaks to the general cynicism around voting. You hear a lot of, well, it's just going to be stolen anyway, or everyone's equally corrupt or whatever. So how do we sort of trend, turn this, this trend of cynicism around? Wow. You know, I... I, you know, we need to it's fall in tall love order, with our I country realize. again. <laughs> we have, well, yeah, we have no, 45 we need more minutes to figure this out. So let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's do it. I, you yeah. know, we need to fall in love with our country again. You right. know, we need to fall in love with each other again. You know, we need to, we need to, you know, be again, okay with people not seeing things the same way, whatever tribe you're in, whatever political tribe you subscribe to, it's time to again, respect are, are people who are not like us. And it's time to respect people on the other side of the aisle um, and to fall in love with the idea of the great American experiment. Um, you know, and then, and, and also be okay with losing. Sometimes mm-hmm. you're, you're the person you vote for is not going to win. And it's like, just breathe. It's okay. Mm-hmm. I'm going to wake up tomorrow. I'm going to turn on my electricity. I'm going to have a warm, ha- like everything's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that, so I don't know how you rewin the hearts and minds of, of, of your countrymen and yeah. to, you know, start, you know, learning that, you know, like, Hey, that guy that I don't agree with, or, or the, the lady I see that I've kind of ignored because like her, you know, her Facebook posts or her Twitter posts are just so absurd. Like maybe it's time to, you know, fall in love again, mm-hmm. <laughs> I guess would be a one way to, one way to look at it. And also we, we also need to re-rely on that inner voice that we all have. You know, if absurd things are coming across, if hyperbolic and absurd things are coming across the news wire or across a social media feed, just breathe. It's probably not true. Mm-hmm. You know, laugh at it and just go, yeah, yeah, okay. I wish that was true about the person I don't like, but come on. No, yeah. it's, it's, it's not true. Yeah. So, yeah, I was going to say that's, that's, I think that's almost harder. It's, it's one thing to say, uh, you know, look at the terrible thing that's happening to the guy I don't like, but it's even harder to sort of like, oh, this great thing that I like about this candidate that's probably unlikely is probably also not happening. So, but yeah, I think it also Correct. speaks, it also speaks to sort of a, a need for some degree of media literacy that we don't have anymore, that there's just, there's such a rash of, sort of strange quasi legitimate or illegitimate, you know, news sites that are quickly shared on social media before anyone can do, you know, fact checking. I remember in 2016, 2017, there were so many, like I was, I was going to bookstores to take classes on media literacy, you know, like they, and they mm. would literally just like send links of like, here's fact checking groups. Here's, you know, nonpartisan things. Here's a spectrum of things across the political spectrum that whether you agree with them or not are, fact checked and and means tested and whatever you know but there's there's that that sense that that's that's not the case for a lot of people right now correct and even the term fact checking will send a chill down some yeah. you know half the country's spine sure and the other half will be cheerleading this so-called fact check you know right. industry so even something even something even something is non-controversial and level-headed and medium the, the sentences you just said are still cause for controversy nowadays. Sure. Uh, and so, you know, media literacy is interesting, but I, that's an interesting concept. But, you know, we, I, I find it that, e- like, I don't understand. I mean, I understand from a marketing perspective, but it's heartbreaking to watch my great country's great, new, these once great news organizations just start down this very, this very dangerous road of, you know, they have the truth, right? You know, they, they're, and they're the only ones that have the truth. And it's, it's, you know, the reason our adversaries conduct these campaigns is because they work. The yeah. reason our adversaries conducted against their own people is because they work. And because if you just accept this is the new reality, which I don't accept, I don't accept the premise that this is, has to be our new reality. Yes. In my house, it's not the new reality. But, you know, we double down on these things because they work. It's, mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, I, I just wish there were, you know, more voices out there that just like everybody breathe. Yeah. The other side is not the end of the world. My side is not the only source of truth. 
Mm-hmm. And sometimes the, the, my side's going to win and sometimes my side is going to lose and I'm still going to shake their hands. I'm still going to be polite. I, I, I'm, it's all good. I can still rage. I can still be sad. I mean, please, I can still rage and be sad, but I'm not going to, you know, reputationally abuse the other side, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, but, you know, I think, I think going back to sort of the notion of like getting to the bottom of a story, I think one of the things that you hear a lot is, you know, from people who reflexively share things that they think, you know, well, that's it. That person's done for, or, you know, this person got completely taken down is that, that, you know, everyone's so busy now and everyone feels like I don't have time to go back to the congressional record to see if this really happened or not. But that's, but that's, that's part of it. Like you're, you know, the, you know, I realized that there's like not a panacea of like perfect even handed news going back to the fifties or sixties or seventies or whatever. But like, there's also this feeling that like, I don't, I don't even know where to start looking to see whether this is true or not. You know what I mean? Exactly. And you know, the, uh, and, and again, I just want to clear up something very quickly. Um, what's going on today is that we've also accepted the false premise that our adversaries have a side in our political fight. Yeah. They don't have a side. They don't have a preferred candidate. Mm. We always have to ask ourselves, why are they doing this right Right. now? Right. Okay. Why does it appear that they are supporting one candidate over the other? Why? Okay. Now it's not because that's the person they want elected. Right. They usually lean on the open door. That's going to lead to the most chaos. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, not because they, in my opinion, in my experience, and with with my knowledge of how our adversaries work and how they view us, they view us the same way they view themselves. They don't think we're any different. They just think we're better at pretending we're we live in a free society than they do. And so, they, so again, that cynicism is is mm-hmm. being that 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 Central Eurasian cynicism with regard to our leaders, with regard to politics, with regard to the election process, with regard to the basic and fundamentals of liberty, you know, that cynicism, they're, they're turning their laser beam, focusing it on the United States political system and saying, aha, that that's actually working now. Like they Mm -hmm. are tribal and see, they're not so, they're just as bad as we are and see, you know, and, and again, to be clear, they don't have a preferred side. They right. don't trust any of us, actually. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, uh, speaking to that, it seems like there's probably a decent chance that no anti-tampering legislation is going to come through in time for 2020. So, what can citizens do to take this issue into their own hands? How do we dismantle this system that allows outright propaganda or disinformation to flourish? Pet a dog. Pet your cats. Lo- <laughs> hug your loved ones. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I mm-hmm. think that's the biggest. Uh, well, okay. I'm only half joking because um, we need to trust ourselves. Yeah. We need to trust the inner voice. We need to trust that when something so absurd comes in front of our face, even if it's against a person we don't like and we want it to be true. My goodness. I really hope this person, you know, loves to, you know, abuse kittens or whatever mm-hmm. it is like, Oh man, I really hope this person hates kittens. You know, it's prop. It's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, let's just, you know, there are already plenty of laws on the books. It is illegal to tamper with um, voting machines. It's illegal right. to, ba- to ballot stuff. It's illegal to register people who aren't alive or who, of course. you know, it's, it's yes. already illegal to vote twice. Oh. You know, like all these <laughs> sure. things already exist, right? Sure. There's also and, a, and, a whole lot of uh, selective enforcement of that. I mean, <laughs> correct. Again, yeah. again, correct. Like, you know, but I, I, I just, books. <laughs> correct. Like, yeah. yeah. And but please, if, if, if you can hear me and you're thinking about doing something on behalf of your political tribe, that's nefarious. Please don't do it. It's okay. Right. And it's okay to lose. It's okay. Like we're going to be fine. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, you know, I, there is, there's already enough legislation. I think it's really about respecting the, the United States voter again. And, and we need to get our, get, we need to get rid to the best of our ability, this idea that, uh, somehow, um, how can I say this? This idea that there's a dumb voting populace. Mm-hmm. You know, people are entitled to have their opinions right. and they're in, in like, and that's okay. 
And just because somebody doesn't have all the facts that you have, it doesn't like they deserve, everybody deserves their voice to be heard. And, and one thing that scares me a, a lot is when elections don't go the way in, in, in other countries, when elections don't go the way that they had tried to make them go, mm-hmm. let's say they begin trying to win the election via the legal system. Right. Or to overturn the results of a, of a free, of a kind of free and a kind of fair election. I'm sp- speaking of other countries now mm-hmm. through the legislature, through the courts, you know, or let's just say like um, in other countries, even if the election goes their way, but they didn't win by as much as they thought they should have won. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're seeing people thrown in jail in other countries because of alleged ties to foreign governments. Right. I mean, it, 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 we, it goes down a, a really silly and scary place when you start, when the temper tantrum persists, right. when we can't be okay with losing mm-hmm. for, for a few years, it's, it's going to be okay. Like we're only going to lose for a few years and then, then it's fine, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and so that's the pattern I see in other countries. And, and then I look here and I go, my goodness, please. No, 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 no. We don't need this right now. We'll never need this. This is still a great country. We're still the envy of the world even with all of our shortcomings, um, we're better than this. We are. And that message is not being promulgated right. and, or disseminated in my opinion. Uh, so on an even larger scale than, than bots and social media farms and so forth to spread disinformation, you have uh, things like Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica who can sway elections via marketing campaign. So do you have any thoughts on any safeguards that have been put in place to prevent this? And if there aren't any, what safeguards could realistically be put in place so, you know if it's a clear that this will be a once again unregulated 2020 what do we do to combat influences like this well again you know secure your s3 boxes secure your uh buckets mm-hmm. um you know there are still companies that do this today mm-hmm. um they it's all legal they legally purchase in our information from social media uh, we've agreed to it when we agree to the terms we're okay with that and so there's nothing inherently illegal about companies such as Cambridge Analytica, or it's not even illegal. Uh, it's maybe in bad taste nowadays, but it's not illegal to uh, employ their analytics. Like, what have you learned about the voting population? I mean, it's, it's all about gathering the best information for your campaign. Okay, so I don't want to outlaw, you know, people wanting more information about how to reach their preferred voting population to, you know, hey, vote for me because I, I'm going to solve world hunger or whatever, you know, right. the, the, it is. So I'm weary to start thinking that, you know, we need to start legislating against people learning about how to reach the voting populace here in this country. I'm nervous about that. Right. Um, you know, uh, tactics. And again, where I worry is that, you know, I don't, I didn't hit that I agree to them mishandling the information once they have it. Mm-hmm. Meaning, I've a, I, I haven't agreed for you to leave my information exposed to the to the nefarious actors on the dark web or to um, to foreign entities who are trying to use me, my social media, to retweet, to you know, to become my friend and to infiltrate my friends and and then you know do their misinformation campaigns. I didn't agree to be a part of an right. uh, intelligence operation. So you know. I, Again, like I'm, I'm hesitant to really come out strongly against uh, firms like that because everybody does it. Um, yeah. You know, the guy starting out who's starting a business needs information about the target market he wants or she wants to target. You know, th- they deserve to have that information, um, le- you know, purchased legally and to make their business awesome. Same with uh, candidates who are running in this country, you know. So, yeah, uh, you know, I, I know this is maybe a bit unpopular, but I, you know, all all the parties do it, <laughs> all the candidates do it. They 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 go, they contact these types and to message us. And so when when an intelligence operation uses the same methods and tradecraft that you know private business and private individuals use for good, that's where it gets tricky. So I don't want to legislate only because bad guys did it. I, I, this is where it gets a little tricky. 
Okay. Uh, so what are some dangers to watch out for from a social engineering perspective? Are there things that voters should be watching for that are out there? Like there's been reports of, you know, phishing campaigns that use email or phone calls to gather information or fake information disseminated in the forms of phone polling or attempts to harvest registration from phones. Uh, like on a pure sort of technical level, how should people keep themselves and their information protected as we come into the election season? Stellar, stellar question. And this needs to get out, you know, this needs to get out. It's your identity. It's your electronic footprint. Please own it. Own where you go in, on the internet. Own it. Be purposeful. Don't click on everything. Don't sign up for everything. And what, if you have, and you know, get a gri- grip on where your email is being used for marketing pur- Again, legal, completely above board marketing purposes. Get a handle on it. Unsubscribe. If you don't recognize emails, delete them. It doesn't matter. If you don't recognize the phone number, don't answer it. Mm-hmm. Block it. Subscribe. There are services out there that will, you know, filter these types of phone calls. Yep. Listen to your inner voice. You are smarter than you think. Your gut will not. And, and if it is a loved one trying to find you after 20 years, they'll there's find not, another way. Yeah, right. <laughs> they'll find another way. So, yep. You know, we don't need to be so anxious to answer all the mail, to answer all the phone calls. Be purposeful, be smart, be vigilant. And having a default mindset of security is is great. Yeah. But Uh, get out there and get a grip on what what your digital footprint is and start owning it and like minimizing it. Get get to know your, uh, your security settings on everything you do. Google yourself. Yeah. Search for yourself. Yeah. I mean, it, you'll, it'll be eye open. <laughs> you'll be surprised. Absolutely. Um, so can you give us any tips or strategies around separating fact from fiction regarding election coverage? Are there certain types of red flags to watch out for when seeing or considering, you know, sending out a potentially quote unquote game changing news story that comes across your social media feed? Yeah. I, I So my, my advice is, you know, breathe. If it's too much, if it's too sensational, you're probably unknowingly becoming a part of a misinformation campaign. Yeah. I'm not pushing, if it's pushing your button, sort of, if you're like, oh, I knew it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And mm-hmm. even if it's in support of the person you like. Right. You know, if it sets you off and if it taps into that part of our psyche that sets you off, like super excited, su- yeah. super angry. Right. You know, it starts at the individual. The individual needs to begin to own what they spread, you know, or, and maybe just walk away, turn it off. Yeah. It's okay. Right. You know, I've, I've done that in my house. I've simply turned TVs off. I've, I've minimized, I've been purpose. I've minimized my social media footprint. I've, I've set strict boundaries around yep. my time on social media. Uh, what I choose to use it for. Um, it starts at the individual. But, you know, again, I, I just I would hate for us to get into the mindset that we need somebody else to fix it. Yeah, um, I think the individual knows themselves well enough and their families well enough to let's start there and let's not become a part of the problem. Yeah, I think during especially stressful times, it feels like sort of scrolling your social media feed for political news. It, 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 it sort of triggers sort of like an addictive aspect of your personality. And I know when things are going very bad, like I, I obsessively scroll with that feeling that like the next news piece is going to be the one where it's like, everything's going to be fine, you know? And I think there's a lot of people out there that, you know, there's just that endless feeling of like, Oh, I got to just look for one more thing. And that's going to tell me that I can stop worrying about this, but you don't get to stop worrying about this. It's, it's, more no, nuanced. it's not, it's more nuanced than that. You're right. That's an, that's an excellent observation. Yeah. Um, and so it, again, I believe in the individual. I believe that, that people can, can uh, use their powers for good. And I believe that one day we'll snap out of it. I'm also waiting for like uh, my social media feed for the guy that hypnotized us to go, okay. And you're back. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We're a great country. Uh, so speaking of sort of media literacy and stuff, do you, can you sort of suggest, you know, without being, you know, partisan or whatever, certain ways of 
bringing the voting populace up a bit more to up to speed about sort of current and security dangers, even not necessarily this candidate says this or this candidate says this, but like, you know, do you have any suggestions for getting people to realize like foreign actors do these things or, you know, voting boxes can still be hacked, you know, all, you know, they, they don't have enough, you know, their firmware isn't updated fast enough or they're too old or things like that. Like, what do you, what are your thoughts on, on sort of getting that level of education out? Oh man, what a great question. Um, and I'm going to fall back on the, on the, on the silly sign that we see everywhere. Uh, it's cliche, but it works. Um, if you see something, say something. Mm -hmm. If, if you're in line to cast your vote and somebody's breaking a rule, somebody's out campaigning closer than they should, somebody approaches your, knocks on your door after voting registration has legally ended and is asking you to register to vote, you know, get their information, ask them yeah. why they're out here. What are you doing? I did that once. I was, I was in a neighborhood while I was driving through the neighborhood one day in, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And it was a few days past to, you know, the legal registration to, to vote. And I, I stopped and I saw these people. I recognized them by their shirts and I, they, they were, I mean, they weren't hiding. Yeah. You know, I stopped and I said, excuse me, uh, what, what are you guys out doing today? You know, it looks like you're having, you know, it's a beautiful day. What are you out doing today? Oh, you're registering to vote, but didn't that deadline pass? Can I have your information? Like, this seems a little, in, this is interesting to me. I don't understand yeah. why you're out voting you know, or, or registering people to vote. And, you know, they just walked away. They didn't want to talk to me. So, sure. uh, I mean, if you see something, say something. If you're, if, if, um, if you're getting things in your email, don't click on them. If you're getting yeah. things, hey, register to vote. It's not too late. And you know it's too late. It's a trick. Yeah. You know, people, people just need to reassert ownership over, over this process. This, right. this country doesn't belong to not somebody else, right? It's ours, you know? Yeah. And, and the, this is a uniquely American thing. And I actually am very grateful that each state, each county, each city, each precinct has its own way of doing it. Cause there can't be a coordinated attack effort. You know, they can, right. you can, you can, you know, they can uh, rabble rouse here, but you can't, you know, you know, meddle or interfere the same way you know, one County over. Right. Um, so, you know, take ownership voter um, and just recognize that you're a lot more well-informed than you are. And okay. So, so uh, you know, sort of fast forwarding to, you know, we're talking like days before the election we've, you know, everyone's got their opinion, everyone's ready to go, you know, what have you. But, yep. you know, now we're at that point where there's the possibility for mechanical tampering, for cyber mm -hmm. tampering, whatever, um, you know, sort of playing, you know, armchair quarterback. What's 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 the balance to be found between watching out for social engineering concerns versus out and out software fraud? What, what, what do you think should be the focus for this next cycle based on what you've seen? Social engineering is already happening. Yeah. Uh, the, the, this is a, the social engineering is an ongoing uh, operation, especially when it's conducted on behalf of a very sophisticated and adversarial nation state. When I mean adversarial is that, you know, another country that views us as their primary adversary. Um, so social engineering, it's going to continue and it's happening right now right. with regard to securing our to, with regard to securing um, our votes at the electronic level, at the at the network level. You know, this is where I have very strong feelings that it's the public and partner, public and private partnerships. I think, you know, the public sector should absolutely reach out to to trustworthy uh, private um, expertise. I think the public sector has a ha, could learn a lot from what you know we do in the private sector nowadays um, to help secure our own systems. And maybe, you know, there there should be increase in that partnership um, and without a fear of. I don't know. There's a lot of distrust right now. There's a, there's a fear of distrust and, and the federal government and local governments um, have their reasons. You know, you can't just let anybody into your systems. I mean, I, I get it. Yeah. Uh, but you know, i um, spreading the expertise and sharing expertise across disciplines, I think um, will absolutely help us prepare for 2020 and beyond um, at that, at that, at that very technical level. Okay. Sketch out to me. I, I just thought of this, like what based on sort of like, public, you know, private sector versus public sector security technology aspects. What, like, draw me a prototype of, like, a reasonably safe voting machine. Like, what, what's a thing that's in your ideal, in your head version of a voting machine that's maybe not there right now for a lot of places? Because I, mm -hmm. I know, you know, some of them are 20 years old, 30 years old. There's, you know, talk about firmware issues or 
things that just can't be secured. You know, I'm not talking about like someone whisks away a you know, box of ballots or whatever, but like, you know, I think there's, there's legitimate concerns about like outdated technology that's very easy to hack and things like that. Like what, what do you imagine as like a very good, I'm not gonna say unhackable, but a very good hack resistant voting machine. Well, I would, I wouldn't want any voting machine that I had in my precinct to transmit anything at all ever. Okay. Um, yes, it can be electronic. Yep. Uh, you know, you slide your ballot in and it reads it however it reads it. Like I'm not against technology by any stretch of the imagination, but I wouldn't want any voting machine that transmits, uh, you know, unless it's, you know, done in a very, very secure manner. But yep. while it's standing still and while it's not needing to transmit, those trans, those transmit, the, uh, all those signals that transmit are, are turned off. Uh, until it's time to tally the votes. Uh, but even then, right, it gets very precarious because when it begins yep. to transmit, you know, you're opening a, a, a screen door. Uh, and so it's, you know, that's, we're never, we're never going to have, oh man, did I just say never? It's highly unlikely that <laughs> right. we'll ever create, that we'll ever create a uniform hack proof voting system here in the United States. It's just not within our, it's just not in our culture to have a uniform, you know, thing that's equal for, you know, from Kansas to DC, you know, we just, we're not going to have like the same thing in each precinct. So uh, I would just want to minimize, you know, minimize signals uh, in my voting machines. I don't minimizing transmittable signals would be my preference. Okay. So I, when I wrote this question, I realized, you know, this is, I, I feel like you've already kind of answered this a few times, but if you were given a magic legislative gavel to pass a passel of laws, you know, to make voting safer or more accurate, what, what would you enact? It sounds like that's not necessarily where your head goes, but, but no, I think it's a great, I love going to these mind, mind spaces where, you know, we get to, we get to push ourselves to think a little bit more. No, you know, I, you asked me that question. I think about it. I, you know, I would just, I wouldn't even want to, I wouldn't even want to wave a wand to like change a law. I'd want to wave a wand. I wouldn't even want to wave a wand to, to get people to think like me. I would just want people's heart rate to go down. I would wave a mm-hmm. wand so people's pulse would like be like at a healthy level and and just their hearts would soften a bit because I believe in the individual. Like I, I really do. I, I believe people are, are so fascinating and complicated and wonderful. Uh, and that I, I, and then once individuals make a decision, you know, there's impact in that. Once an individual decides I'm not going to buy into the common belief that whatever, fill in the blank. I'm not going to become a, an unwitting participant in this, in this really interesting and kind of dangerous circus that's going on right now. You know, you know, when, when I'm approached about a, like, uh, I'm not saying me, but if I could wave a wand, I would say, okay, when you're approached about a political, whatever the, the outrage of the day is, Mm -hmm. I heard that, you know, this candidate, you know, likes to, you know, kick puppies when they're, you know, it's like, okay, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to breathe and go, he doesn't kick puppies. Right. They don't kick puppies. Like no, no yeah. nobody, nobody does that. Right. Okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm skeptical of, of when a large group of imperfect people get together and think they know more. Um, again, well-intentioned. <laughs> lawmakers are very well intentioned. I don't think that they're out going, how can I take over the world and, right. you know, accomplish the, the new world order. I, I think it's more like, wow, we need to do something, but mm-hmm. let's not be hasty in what to, to fix, to fix things that we've created, you know? And, um, boy, I love that question. I didn't give you a good answer, but I would, <laughs> I would wave a wand and I would say, okay, everybody, you know, computers have to be off for 24 hours. That's what I would, that's right. the one that's right. the okay. So I, I like cutting the cord for a while. Yeah, I, I would mandate a twenty-four hour fast from uh, all internet connectivity. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I would do. Sounds like uh, bliss to me. <laughs> uh, uh, just one day. Just one yeah, day. Yeah. <laughs> just deep breath. Uh, so to wrap up today, uh, summarize your fears and hopes for the next election and elections to come. You know, what's one. What's one thing that was adopted, uh, if, if it was adopted across the populace, would help you sleep better between now and November 2020? Hmm. My hope is that we fall in love with each other again as a country. Hmm. My fear 
is that we double down on the path we're currently on. Let's stop. Let's stop demonizing each other. Let's stop thinking that the more we do this, whoever the individual or group, the intelligence operation that was conducted against the United States that really was brought to the forefront in 2016 is ongoing and they're not even having to do anything right now. They're just leaning back going, wow, all we had to do was hand it off yeah. to the media. And I'm not picking a side here. I mean, all of us. Mm -hmm. And they're running with it. These, these foreign actors are no longer having to pour gasoline. We're doing it now to ourselves. So my fear is that we double down on this path we've chosen. My hope is that we won't and that we'll, we'll fall in love again and, and laugh at each other again, laugh at ourselves again about how silly our candidate is sometimes. Um, and that we just kind of get back to being the way we were <laughs> before, before this thing happened. Um, and I know we will get there. I, I, I do believe we'll get there. Well, Adam Dara, thank you very much for your time and insights today. Chris, it's been a pleasure. And I really appreciate the, the great questions, man. This has really forced some great thoughts. And I hope I haven't said anything too silly or, or, or awful. <laughs> nope, absolutely. We, we, we appreciate your insights and uh, very glad you could make the time today. Anytime, uh, Chris. Talk so, to you later. All right. And thank you all for listening and watching. If you enjoyed today's video, you can find many more on our YouTube page. Just go to youtube.com and type in CyberWork with InfoSec to check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts. Just search CyberWork with InfoSec in your favorite podcast catcher of choice. To see the current promotional offers available to listeners of this podcast, go to infosecinstitute.com slash podcast. And again, as I said at the top of the hour, use our free election security training resources to educate poll workers and volunteers on the cybersecurity threats they may face during election season. For information about how to download your free training packet, visit infosecinstitute.com forward slash IQ forward slash election dash security dash training, or click the link in the description probably below. Thanks once again to Adam Dara, and thank you all again for watching and listening. We'll speak to you next week.